early at 1:30 mm-hmm. but well, he said he's going to take more than an hour okay so mm-hmm. while we have break for lunch okay that yeah yeah sure sure okay let's just quickly go over some of the applications of phylogenies again this will hopefully give you some ideas as to what projects you can take up uh so <clears throat> these are some of the applications um the most fundamental application is in systematics um and we talk about phylogenetic diversity uh, there is a whole uh, new way of classifying organisms that is coming up now uh, there's lot of debate so people want to replace linnean tra- taxonomy with uh, uh, phylogenetic uh, taxonomy phylogenetic nomenclature uh, also called as phylocode so they yeah they apply they have come up with a rankless uh phylogeny based classification so you can look it up if you just do search phylo code you know uh, so there's like a whole list of what rules to follow and all that uh and you know there's also application in biogeography species evolution so i'll just quickly go over some of them uh molecular systematics let me give you an example from my own lab um these are different species of langurs from uh, india and southeast asia these are the different classification schemes you know uh which is the right classification that was the big question when we started this work and uh, the most in- important thing was you know this particular species hanuman langur was thought to be very distinct from the rest it was assigned a different uh, genus name when compared to the other species uh, for example if you look at these two classification schemes hanuman langur is in semnopithecus whereas the rest are all in the genus trachypithecus i don't know if you people can see it it's very light color but anyway it's better here hanuman langur in semnopithecus all the other species in trachypithecus right uh in india we had two tra- uh, i mean in south uh, in Pen- peninsular india and sri lanka we have two species of uh, trachypithecus there's nilgiri langur and purple face langur now when we build the phylogeny oh yeah so basically trachypithecus is found in southeast uh, southwest india and southwest sri lanka everything else is hanuman langur semnopithecus so trachypithecus has disjunct distribution right but when we build the phylogeny turns out what we thought was trachypithecus is actually branching with hanuman langur so it's basically semnopithecus so there is no uh, disjunct distribution so this these two species were thought to be with them and you know why that confusion arose any ideas what is this is trachypithecus monophyletic or is it what remember these two were thought to be trachypithecus but they're not it's not branching with trachypithecus so is trachypithecus monophyletic no so what is it polyphyletic right so it's convergence in this case these two species share many characters with southeast asian langurs turns out they occupy similar habitats hanuman langur is largely in the dry area areas these two are in you know evergreen forest so is the case with southeast asian langurs so it is a classic case of convergence right uh and then you have golden and cat langur which is found in northeast india some markers put them with so all of this now is semnopithecus so some markers put them with semnopithecus others put them with trachypithecus so what we kunal's work basically showed that this is a, of hybrid origin so if you look at the distribution of golden and cat langur it is sandwiched between semnopithecus and trachypithecus right so basically molecular data here has helped us uh, clarify some of these issues so i'm going to just skip all that so all of this is now semnopithecus all of this is the main trachypithecus and these langurs from northeast of hybrid origin and probably they should be assigned to a different genus you know uh we have already talked about this uh so there is um, a whole area of called by 
geography which i'll talk about tomorrow uh, very exciting area uh, huge application huh? last day last day day 5 so that's when i'll talk more about it so now let's skip this this is one of the other applications of uh, phylogenetics uh, yeah quick question yeah. so this golden uh, leaf and cap leaf uh, do they have reproductive isolation as well? Do they still meet with synaphilism Now there is complete isolation simply because, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, there is there is no range overlap. You know, so synaphilism does not uh, overlap with uh, golden cap, and they golden cap also does not overlap with uh, trachypithecus. Oh, except in Tripura. In Tripura, cap langur overlaps with uh, one of the trachypithecus. But there is a huge difference in body size. You know, So I forgot to mention, uh, the golden and cap langur, the body size is intermediate between semnopithecus and, and trachypithecus. Right? So there are many lines of evidence that suggest that they are uh, hybrid. They, what, what else? There was something else, no, Kunal? Body uh, size? Skull size. Skull size. And of course, the distribution, sandwiched between the two uh, areas. So anyway, uh, by, by, yeah. So, uh, it seems to be like that the golden seems to be the hybrid. Hmm. So if you look into the molecular level, what are the you know, uh, markers to be used for uh, specifying like this might be the uh, hybrid, I mean for hybrid species? Do you, any marker will do. Basically, what you should uh, find in the ideal situation, uh, if the if the parental species have two different alleles, the hybrids will show both the alleles. Okay. Right? Not the ongoing hybridization. Yeah, yeah, in an ideal situation. Yeah, that that would be you know you can immediately say oh that is a hybrid. Parent for a particular gene, parent has allele A, the other parental species has allele B, the hybrid will have A and B. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, uh, you know, mitochondrial tree will look, give one relationship, nuclear tree will give another relationship, that's what we have found. But if it is an ancient hybridization, some of the signature of hybridization, what happened in the past, is lost. Uh, that's when you'll have to use many markers uh, to figure out, you know, uh, whether hybridization has occurred or not. Yeah. So to differentiate between an ongoing hybridization and one that has been done already, yeah. so we should ideally rely on more markers. More markers and more sampling. More sampling. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. True, true. Okay, so this part I will skip now. Uh, so, uh, phylogenies are sort of central uh, when it comes to understanding speciation, right? Uh, when we want to understand speciation, we want to look at sister species, right? And you you need a, a phylogeny to establish that. That you know you're actually looking at sister species, and then you can go on to ask the question: Is it allopatric speciation? Is it sympatric speciation? Allopatric speciation, as you know, uh, occurs when uh, subpopulations get isolated because of a barrier, so their their ranges are not overlapping. So if you have species that have ranges that are not overlapping and they are sister, then one can potentially, I mean, one can say that it's possibly uh, allopatric speciation. Whereas if their ranges overlap and their sister, this could be because of sympatric speciation, right? But this is just a starting point to say that it's sy sympatric speciation. Maybe in the past they were allopatric and now they have become sympatric. So then you have to look into ecological data. So, you know, uh, phylogenies are very important in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in such cases. Can you, can you just repeat? Yeah, so this is sympatric uh, distribution, right? So there are two species. One is that, the other species is that. Their distributions overlap, right? And if, they, it, if it turns out that they are sister species, then it's probably sympatric speciation, you know, also called as ecological speciation, right? So you have a single species in an area now occupying slightly different niches, 
their distributions overlap, uh, and then you know they, they undergo speciation. So, but for that you need the phylogenetic information, which will, which will tell you that they are sister species, right? They have to be sister species to the uh, for us to figure out if it is uh, this process. Uh, another area where uh, phylogenies have been extensively used, and uh, you know Chaitanya's talk today afternoon, you know, will get into that is when it comes to identifying cryptic species. Right. So here you have. Say, oh, I don't know why this looks okay. That's that was thought to be one species, and this is another species, and this is another species based on morphology, right? And when you do the molecular work, you realize that what was thought to be a single species actually shows a lot of uh, deep uh, consists of two populations, which shows a lot of uh, divergence, and that divergence is um, comparable to the kind of divergence that you are seeing between two established species. But these populations look morphologically similar. Right? So such uh, cases, uh, we call them cryptic species. And uh, one can uh, then go on to use species delimitation tools that Chaitanya will talk about today afternoon. Right? And then you have a case of budding speciation. This is uh, parapatric, also sometimes referred to as parapatric speciation, where you have uh, subpopulations of a widely distributed uh, species in the periphery, sort of budding off and becoming a different species, right? And in situations like this, the species uh, that the new species is nested phylogenetically within the more widely distributed species. Right? So if you get a pattern like this, it's probably budding speciation. Um, so anyway, so there are lots of ways one can uh, uh, use. So just as an example, you have uh, in langurs, you have two different morphological types. Uh, in Hanuman langurs, the northern type and southern type. And they all have parapatric distribution. Um, so. Uh, basically, now we know that there are actually two different species. Um, in fact, we have three different species in Peninsular India. Uh, so, I have to say, quick, quick yeah. so, the line that you have drawn, that uh, dotted lines, yeah. so that is the line that where you found these two distinctions? Uh, the That's line. sort of the boundary line between the distributions of the two species. Yeah. Oh, okay. That is a point where you see the divergence of these two. No, no, no. Uh, the northern morphological type comes till here, the southern one till there. Yeah. And in this area, you sometimes see them, uh, yeah, sometimes there's also a hybrid zone there between the two, you know. Uh, but anyway, so when we looked at the molecular data, so all of this was thought to be a single species. So when we looked at the molecular data, they separated out into these two clades. And morphologically also, you know, there is some difference. Uh, so now we know the, uh, what was called Hanuman langur actually consists of four species, you know, and it's all uh, molecular data. Another very interesting application of phylogenetics uh, is character evolution. Okay, so where you map a particular character onto the phylogeny to understand its evolution. Uh, Chanvi will talk more about it tomorrow, so I'm, I'm just going to skip it. Uh, Uh, this is an exciting project that I would eventually like to take up. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, you know this uh, lizard, it's called skink, and in skinks you have limblessness. Uh, gradation of limblessness across various skink groups in different continents. So, you know, one interesting question is, how many times has limblessness arisen in this group? Right, and what are the the molecular and uh, uh, developmental processes that govern limblessness? Is it the same process in these different groups? Wherever there has been an independent loss of uh, limb uh, limbs, so there's lots of interesting evolutionary uh, developmental biology questions that can be addressed using systems like this. In fact, in India also we have limbless uh, skinks. Um, so again, you need a phylogeny 
for many of this kind of work. <clears throat> now people have been doing what is called as uh, uh, phylogenomics. Genome, uh, understanding genome evolution in a phylogenetic framework. So you build the phylogeny and then uh, you have complete genomes of all those species Right? And then you look at various aspects of the genome. Genome size to rearrangements of, uh, that have occurred within these genomes, number of genes, uh, duplication events, and map all that onto the phylogeny to understand how these genomes have evolved, which was the ancestral state, and so on. Right? Uh, so a lot of this work has been going on uh, in recent years. Uh, and then there is, uh, I was hoping actually Karthik Sunagar had uh, spoken more about this. Uh, there's a whole area of molecular evolution that some of these folks also have been working on, uh, where you are trying to understand gene evolution in a phylogenetic framework. Okay? Uh, so what happens is whenever you have a change, uh, in uh, a protein, uh, 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 change in the DNA sequence uh, in, a, in a gene, uh, many times those changes does not result in a change in amino acid. Right? And what do we call such changes? Silent, Silent changes or synonymous changes. Right? And sometimes the, those, uh, these changes result in change in amino acids. These are called uh, uh, non-synonymous changes, right? And most of these changes, uh, the silent changes are in the third position of the codon, right? Because uh, third position of the codon is often a degenerate site. Any change does not result in change in amino acid. Whereas the first and the second position, often you have change in amino acid. So one can actually use this. So Ka is number of non-synonymous substitutions in a gene. When you're comparing uh, two genes from uh, two gene sequences from two different species, and Ks is number of synonymous substitutions. Right? If number of non-synonymous substitutions outnumber the number of synonymous substitutions, what does that mean? Huh? What's that? The gene is evolving. Gene, gene is basically evolving. It is changing. Right? Is, uh, uh, and we call this positive selection. If number of uh, non-synonymous substitutions, I'm sorry, number of synonymous substitutions outnumber non-synonymous substitutions, we call it negative selection. <coughs> the, the gene is under constraint. It is not being allowed to change. Right? Now we can, uh, here's an example, okay? You look at these two sequences from, you know, this is say species one, this is species two. Uh, those are the differences. So, you know, P distance is whatever three divided by the whole length, right? The total number of changes are three. Uh, out of which number of non-synonymous substitutions are two which are those substitutions. This substitution is probably non-synonymous, for sure. CCC, and this has changed to TCC. I mean, this only C has changed to T. So if you look at, uh, where is TC? TCC, okay, that's a serine. And what is CCC? So that's a non-synonymous change. Whereas this one, I believe, is uh, synonymous. Right? You figure it out. It's somewhere here. It's, I think, this one here. Yeah, this one, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So you, you get the picture. Now, if you calculate number of non-synonymous divided by synonymous, if number of non-synonymous non substitutions are more, that means the gene is under positive selection. Right? So in this case, it is 
So the gene is under positive selection. But we don't know along which lineage the gene is under positive selection. So you need to use an outgroup to figure that out. Right? So this is like one area of, of molecular evolution. And you need phylogenies to, to, uh, to uh, help us address some of these questions. Uh, Here is an example of uh, a gene called lysozyme, which is, on, uh, which is under positive selection on the lineage leading to langurs. Uh, turns out, langurs exhibit foregut fermentation just like uh, some ungulates, you know, like buffaloes, cows. They also exhibit foregut fermentation. So basically, these animals eat leafy material, and then there is a bacteria in their gut that uh, digests these things. Uh, these leafy basically helps them break down, I guess. Uh, Something in these leaves, I forget what. Huh? Cellulose. Cellulose, yeah. Uh, and then lysozyme is used to kill the bacteria. Right? This particular gene is under positive selection in the lineage leading to colobin monkeys that are leaf eating monkeys. Other monkeys are not predominantly leaf eating, these are exclusively leaf eating. If you build a phylogeny of mammals, with lysozyme, uh, with lysozyme gene, Hanuman langur will branch with cow and not with other species of uh, monkeys because that gene has changed so much. <coughs> right? So one can build a phylogeny like this and figure out where exactly that positive selection event has taken place. Right? So this is like molecular evolution and I'm trying to understand gene evolution in a phylogenetic framework. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, paper also where they were able to pinpoint the origin of HIV-1 from which population and which subspecies of chimpanzee humans got HIV-1. Uh, so you know, uh, we have uh, two strains of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 came from chimpanzees and HIV-2 from uh, some other Sarcopithecin monkey in Africa. But all this information th is thanks to uh, phylogenetics. Uh, otherwise, there was no way of knowing you know, where these things came from. Basically, HIV, what we are calling HIV is SIV, Simian Immunodeficiency Virus, right? Uh, my last example is uh, co-speciation. This is another exciting area of research where if you have a host and a symbiont, for example, gut microbes and the host, often the phylogeny of the host and the symbiont overlap. They look exactly the same. So every time there is a speciation event in the host, there is also a speciation event in the symbiont. But if the two uh, do not match, that means there has been a host shift, right? So one can use phylogenies to understand some of these uh, questions. Here's an example of a perfect match. Uh, here's a phylogeny of insect host and its bacterial symbiont. It's a perfect match, right? Uh, so this is uh, co-speciation. Uh, studies, uh, again, a lot of uh, research has been done in this area. So anyway, so those are some of the applications of uh, phylogenetics. Um, we will not be discussing uh, many of these, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll look into species delimitation. We'll look into character evolution, biogeography. Uh, what else? One other thing I'm missing. We'll do molecular dating. Um, yeah. Okay. Any questions? Uh, today, uh, you want to start at one thirty, Chaitanya? Yeah. Huh? Uh, so, people, can you come back a little early? Yeah. So that will give you probably just a little over an hour to finish your lunch. Is that okay? Huh?